time tonight. This is a very special night for us up here because this is the very last night of the Armadale season and the last night of what we think has been a very splendid uh, set of music halls. The play is called Everybody's Favourite Lou or Doing Their Bit at the Front, but we'll tell you more about that later on. Music halls achieved their fame in the days in the reign of Queen Victoria. And it's always customary at these music halls to commence the evening by, in our own way, saluting our dear Lady Queen Victoria and, their, and also at the end of the night to honour her and her reign by singing Land of Hope and Glory. At the dinner performances, we always have a toast to Queen Victoria. I know you haven't got dinner tonight, but that doesn't stop us still honouring Queen Victoria, and therefore I'm going to ask you to stand and sing whilst the band accompanies you, sing God Save the Queen. Quite legal. It's not 
Snodgrass, former solicitor and now my personal assistant, will explain. Spare us further explanation, Smedley. It is bad enough that my dear sister Penella and I have had to accept you as our half-brother. Though you are born out of wedlock, for a woman of ill repute to inveigle her way into my father's affections, we nevertheless accepted you into our family and treated you as one of ourselves. Little did we think that whilst our father was on his deathbed, you would worm your way into his confidence and, with the help of Snodgrass here, persuade him to name you heir and successor to Groom's Head, an estate which, since the time of William the Conqueror, has always gone to the eldest son and rightful heir. No, oh, well, if dear half-brother Jasper had wanted to protect his assets, then perhaps he should have been here. How could I have been here, Smedley? I was away with the army, helping to defend the empire for my beloved queen, Victoria. But whilst I was away, with Gordon heroically defending Khartoum, you were here cheating me out of what was rightfully mine. There is no occasion for you to become offensive. You are all trespassing here now, and on behalf of Mr. Smedley, must ask you to leave. I will leave with pleasure. I do not wish to spend another minute under this accursed roof. It is so unfair! Forced out of your own home! Hideous! Where will you go to, Jasper? <laughs> I will go to Australia. <laughs> But, alas, dear sister, I will have to leave you here in England. <laughs> well, you shan't leave her behind here. But at nine o'clock tomorrow, nine o'clock tomorrow, I will have her and all of you cast out, son. Oh, never has to be covered. Never fear, madam. I have been a loyal and faithful servant of this family all my life. I will protect you.
pair of earrings anyway, I tell you. <laughs> it would not surprise me, Smedley, if this turned out to be another one of your sinister tricks. Ball <laughs> attacks. The balls have gone. They must be found. I have waited for years for this chance. I will not be cheated now. Someone will pay for this. <laughs> is off to Australia. He's not the only one. Quite a lot of people are leaving London tonight on board ship to go to Australia and we're going to join the cast now down at the London Docks where a lot of people are saying goodbye to a lot of friends. So the curtain opens down at the London Docks the next evening. Thank you. <laughs>
I will ever see London and little Sam Wood ever again. Oh, it is sad to have to say goodbye, Brother Jasper. Australia is such a long way away. <coughs> will you be safe, do you think? Never fear, Fenella. Australia is a land of it's a land for men of daring and enterprise. I will be all right. But it is you that I worry about. What will become of you? Never fear on my account. I've always had a passion to try my luck on the stage. I might approach a theatrical agency. You never know what might turn up. You don't know what might turn up on the stage, madam. But never mind. I will be there to help you. Dear Lord, how kind and how loyal you are. How sad it is that we are reduced to such circumstances. All because of wicked Smitty. And it wouldn't surprise me for some sinister reason known only to him. It was he who stole the earrings. I don't think we'll ever know for sure <coughs> who stole the earrings. Alas, it is time for me to go on board. Goodbye, dear sister. Goodbye, Jasper. Write to me from Australia. <laughs>
right on your job. That's all that matters. Now, who were you down by saying off on the steamer? Was it your boyfriend or something? No, that was just my brother Jasper. Like me, he too was falling on hard times and has set off for Australia to make his fortune. Were you seeing somebody off too? Yes, I came down to say goodbye to Elsie. She was one of the barmaids at the music hall. But she could never keep her mind on her job. Far more interested in men. She was so moonstruck she'd serve up beers all night and then forget to charge. Sending me broke she was. So I bought her a friend of Australia. She might strike it lucky or she might. And it's all up to her now, really. I've done all I can for her. How lucky I am to find someone as kind as you, Rose. <coughs> Come along then, we'll get you started in Second Hand Rose's Music Hall. I feel sure Vanilla has the earrings, and I will stop at nothing to get them. <laughs> <laughs> which will only take about half a minute. Let me tell you that after these people went to Australia, they wrote letters, and it's an art which we've forgotten these days, but in those days, they did write letters. Before we get on to the letter writing, and the next scene, however, we'll have a short interview from the orchestra. Thank you, maestro. Uh, and then I'll tell you more about the play nearer the time. <laughs> Here at the music hall, and I'm now a soloist. 
Sometimes I notice wicked half-brother Smedley in the audience, <coughs> but I treat him with contempt. I think he believes that I still have the earrings. Dear Claude is still with me, and he knows I haven't got the baubles. That's right. She hasn't got any baubles, and I haven't got them either. Here at last is a letter from Elsie. I do hope she's been able to get a job in Australia and keep her mind on it once more. Dear Mrs. Secondhand Rose, since coming to Sydney, I have had several jobs, but I keep getting the sack on account of as I can't keep my mind on the job. I have thought about trying to get a job up in the country because I've heard you don't have to be very bright to get a job up there. <laughs> so I should do very well. Well, I'll write again soon. Your affectionate former barmaid, Elsie. <laughs> Now, whilst those letters were being written, life was going on in England. And now, as you know, he's joined Second Hand Rose's Music Hall. And we're going to take up the story back in London at Second Hand Rose's Music Hall. And we hope you'll all join in. Thank you. <laughs> Thank 
kids sat on the railings, thought it was a pantomime. I went round with his tipper, collecting one and three. We shouted, come on, mother, show them your agility. Oh! oh.
want you to do is what all birds do, and that is whistle. And if you whistle and if you flap your arms, enough. When we get to that part of it, she might even fly. Ladies and gentlemen, we ask you to join in whistling with Vanilla. Thank you. Are you ready?
Shakespeare dead.
Fine News, your affectionate former barmaid, Elsie. Oh, oh, P.S. I am pregnant. <laughs> our trip together, little girl, will be a very short one, so I do not think our paths will cross. <laughs> Come, Claude, we must hurry if we are to catch the next steamer to Australia. Change the scenery and had a number from the orchestra. We'll continue with the play. It's about a five minute interval here. Thank you. Go on. Well, we wasn't going to. Ain't 
actually going to ask what it is? Is it? Is it? Of course it is. It's a baby. Where did it come from? Don't you know where babies come from? <laughs> I thought I did. Well, you don't. So listen. I was riding alongside the stagecoach. When I looked inside, I saw a woman nurse the baby. Well, I coached in a pothole, bounced to the sides, in the air, and the baby was thrown out. I managed to catch it just before it hit the ground. That's right, isn't it, six foot? That's exactly the way it happened, Thunderbolts. <laughs> I've considered that. We'll have to keep it for the time being, that is. And we'll have to be very careful or we'll be accused of kidnapping. Now, the coach was on its way to Sydney, so sooner or later there'll be something in the papers about a missing baby. And when we find out who owns it, we'll sneak it back somehow or other. Thunderbox? Yes, Dickwood. I made it about a heart of gold, a will of iron, and nerves of steel, but, well, I'm not equipped. For that sort of thing. <laughs> you'll have to learn real quick, this one. I'll have to learn? Yeah, you've got a sort of a, a motherly look about you. <laughs> but, but, it... Don't it, call it, 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 It's a what? We better take a look and find out. <laughs> it's a girl! sunshine and gladness into our otherwise rough and brutal environment. We have in some respects become softer and more thoughtful men. Go on. Well, since no one has 
claimed little nipperette, I think we can rightfully assume that she's ours. And that being the case, well, the boys and I think that she should have a name. Yeah, well, I've considered that. But if I'm to assume the role of father, what name would you suggest? Names don't go too well with Thunderbox. Pearl Thunderbox, Elsie Thunderbox, Margaret Thunderbox, Kathy Thunderbox. The boys and me have thought of something appropriate. What's that? Louise. Louise? Yeah. Then we can call her Lou, or Lulu for short. What a good idea. <laughs> I've done 
very well, thank you very much. And one day I hope to have saved up enough to come and visit you. That's all. Your affectionate former barmaid, Elsie. Oh, P.S. My little boy has grown up real lovely, thank you very much. And he's going to England and I'll give him your address. That's the sort of advice that many Australian mothers give their sons before they go to England, somebody else's address. Now we're going to take up the story. It's in 1914, would you believe in 1914, little Louise had her 21st birthday. A little later on, there are some other people we're going to celebrate birthdays with. But I'm going to invite you all now to Thunderbox's camp, 1914, tragically the year in which war broke out, but nevertheless, back home, the year in which Louise celebrates her 21st birthday. Is everything ready for the party, six foot? On every day our little Lou turns 21. Ready? Ready? I've been cooking for weeks, slaving away over a hot camp oven and lamingtons. I've made that many lamingtons. It's about time you gave me a new kitchen to work in, Thunderbox. It's not fair the way you expect me to work with a finger to the bone, cooking and cleaning and keeping house, and helping little Lou all these years with the correspondence lessons. If it wasn't for little Lou, I'd have up and off out of here years ago. I may have a heart of gold, a will of iron and nerves of steel, but you've just taken advantage of me. Steady on, steady on. It's all in a good cause. Who'd have thought had a little Lou over 20 years? What a big change to our way of life too, six foot. I guess so, Thunderbox. Made us settle down and consider our responsibilities a bit. I miss the old bush ranging days. But still, I think it's been worth it. Yeah, but all the cream of New England society here tonight to celebrate. And the boys over here have been a lot better off too since they stopped mixing with that Tamworth riffraff. <laughs> Thunderbox, the, the guests are starting to arrive and little Lou isn't here. Where is she? I told you, you know, you've got to do these things proper. Don't back six foot. Here she is now. Dearest Uncle Thunderbox and Uncle Sixfoot, you've both been so kind to me all these years and you've given me everything I've got. I wouldn't be where I am now if it wasn't for you. Oh, don't mention it, girlie. But I must, Uncle Thunderbox. You've often told me how when you found me on the side of the road, all I had to my name was this silly old bobble. Well... Everything else I owe to you. You become everybody's favourite, Lou. Or, I mean, you become everybody's favourite, Lou. <laughs>
if you don't know the words, they're on the sheet if you've got them. I think it's number three. But the following people are celebrating, or celebrating birthdays. Callum McCarty is having a birthday. I'm told it's today, and I believe that. Also, a very special announcement, it's an anniversary. Best wishes for a fond anniversary to James King and Sarah Weinberg. <laughs> What was that? Another PLC girl, Liza Sweeney, is having a 25th birthday <laughs> today. Another birthday is, was yesterday, and a very important one was Richard Rowling's birthday yesterday. He admits to being 23. <laughs> <laughs> right. Everybody, one more time, let me call you sweetheart and come to all of all of those people. Change the subject. But what will I change it? 
to. I don't know. I do. What? Lou, will you marry me? Yes, Gus. Good. Gus, now that we're about to be married, I feel I should tell you that I don't know who I really am. <laughs> what a funny little Billy Wagtail you are. <laughs> You're not theirs? No, Gus. Lou, this is terrible. I wanted to marry you and take you back to live with me, Dunny Danu. But I couldn't possibly marry you if you don't know who you are. I mean, I couldn't even introduce you to my father. I'm really sorry, Gus. <laughs> what will you do now? I mean, you won't slash your wrists or anything like that, will you? <laughs> no, Lou. But you've disappointed me terribly. I'll have to do something to get over it. What? I know. There's a war on in Europe at the moment. The gallant British and Australian soldiers are fighting the hunt. Even little New Zealand is doing her bit. I think that I'll join up and do my bit too. The army? Yes, Lou. Oh, but Gus, you've got flat feet. You'd never get in. That's right. I wouldn't. I know. I know what I'll do. I'll join this new thing called the Flying Corps. Then my flat feet won't count against me. The Flying Corps? Yes, Lou. They're the brave young men who fly around in these new flying machines. And you do all of that just to get over me? You're so brave. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I think we should all go to the front and do our bit. Whether it's a big bit or a little bit, there's room for each of us at the front. And when our country calls us, we'll all be there. <laughs>
with the troops setting off for England and Europe in the war, we're going to take another very brief five minute hit.
famous and very wonderful English performers, second-hand Rose has at her music hall artists from other parts of the world. And this evening, second-hand Rose is very proud to introduce to you an artist from Australia. Someone who is one of Australia's great and most wonderful talents. Someone who is an expert on a very, very difficult musical instrument. Someone I'm sure he will appreciate like you've never appreciated any instrumentalist before. Ladies and gentlemen, to offer a little bit of Australian, truly Australian culture to Second Hand Rose's Music Hall, I'm very pleased to introduce Mr. Stringo, who plays the spoons. <laughs> Mates in the old blue bitch there, one. 
I've read it six times already. That's the book. She says, I'm on the, uh, the track of the other earring, and then I'm going to Paris to the Eiffel Tower Follies to see some people. Then I'm going to become a nurse and drive an ambulance to the front and do my bit. That's a terribly dangerous thing for a young girl to do, six foot. They say things are hotting up up at the front. Then the front I'm worried about. Her being in Paris, I hear tell it's a terribly naughty city. So I'm going over there six foot to see that she comes to no harm. Are you game enough to come with me? And all that way to a city as dangerous as Paris? Of course I am, Thunderbox. Because I've got a heart of gold, a will of iron, and nerves of steel. Very, Very well, well then. Pack your bags and we'll head off to Sydney tonight. We'll catch the first boat for France. We'll bring the old little Lou to the side of Thunderbox where she rightly belongs. Lord, whatever am I going to do? Here is a letter from my brother Jasper, and he's coming to Paris. What can I do? Dear Sister Fenella, it is over 20 years since you left Australia with my little girl, and I have decided that I would like to see her again. With the war going on in Europe, France is a dangerous place, so I want to come over there and fetch her back to Australia with me. My son has grown up and is fighting in the Air Corps in France. I gave him your address and I hope he calls to see you. I'm anxious for him to meet his little half-sister whom he has never seen. My wife cannot make the trip so I am bringing my faithful housekeeper who will be company for, for, me, for my little girl on the journey home. She has a son working in London at the moment and would very much like to see him. Your loving brother, Jasper. Claude, what am I going to do? He wants his daughter back. The one you lost 20 years ago. The same. I have lived with this terrible secret all these years. And now I fear I will be exposed. What am I to do? Don't worry, madam. You'll think of something. You always do. <laughs> Just for his birthday. Mademoiselle. 
I would like to uh, now to introduce Mademoiselle Emma to sing La Vie en Rose. <laughs>
lot worse at the front. Things are quite gay here in Paris. But I'm not feeling very gay, Claude. My brother Jasper is arriving from Australia tonight, expecting to be reunited with his daughter. Oh, my God. 
is arriving from Australia tonight, any minute in fact, and um, I was wondering if you would, just for tonight, pretend to be his daughter. It's just a little joke I'm playing on here. But how could I do that? Surely he would know I was not his daughter. Oh, well, not necessarily. You see, he hasn't seen her since she was a baby. You are from Australia after all. He would never know, I'm certain. But all I want you to do is to help me find I me. will, but you must help me first. What am I to do? Well, I want you, just for tonight, to pretend to be a member of the chorus here at the Eiffel Tower Follies. You've lived with me for over 20 years. You're my niece and Jasper's daughter. Now, Claude, take this sweet child to the dressing room and find her something more glamorous to wear. <coughs> it was a clever plan you had, Mr. Smedley, to mix in with the others so as not to be noticed, but I think we're about to lose track of that girl. We must not lose sight of them, Snodgrass. Did you hear what they said? No, no, not a word. But hang about. Who's this? I give up six foot, we've walked the streets of Paris, and no sign of little Lou anywhere. I think we should have one more night on the town and head back to Australia tomorrow. What'd you say the name of this place was? The Eiffel Tower Follies, Thunderbox. God, you cop an eyeful of that. Jeez, if I got more of an eyeful, I'd have gone blind, Thunderbox. Madam Camilla, Madam Camilla, brother Jasper and lady friend have arrived. And I'm so nervous I can hardly stop tweeting and twitching. Oh, Claude, show them in, but try to get a hold of yourself. If we can just get through this evening, I'll try to think of some explanation by tomorrow. Oh. Fenella, dear sister Fenella. Jasper, dear brother Jasper, it's been so long. And is this your wife? Oh, no. My wife is delicate and does not like sea voyages. This is Elsie, the maid. She has a son in England and I brought her over to see him and also to keep my little daughter company on the journey home. But where is she? It has been so long since I've seen her. Oh, you'll see her soon. Ever since leaving school, she's been singing with the chorus here at the Folly. <laughs> yes, it will be quite a reunion. I have been in touch with my son Angus and he tells me he will meet me here tonight. He is coming to Paris for a bit of R&R &R leave. <laughs> he can hardly wait to meet his little sister. He has not yet seen her, of course. Oh, let's hope he won't be disappointed then. <laughs> what is that strange noise? Oh, that's just some of the chaps. They've been up the front doing their bit for several weeks. And they're looking forward to some good R&R &R back here in Paris. Excellent. My son Angus may be with them. Oh, I
is going on? Dad, this is Lou. I've told you all about her. I'm in love with her. And as soon as she finds out who she really is, I want to marry her. But you cannot. She is your half-sister. That's why Chanel, isn't it? Amanda. <laughs> and now I can't go through with this. If you were Gus's father, oh, if ever I find out who I really am, I want to marry Gus. No, I'm not your daughter. I'm only just pretending. Vanilla, if she is pretending, where is my daughter? Uh, oh, well, I'm... Um, uh, hey! Little Lou, I've been looking all over Paris for you. Six foot and I've been worried about your safety. Lou, are you all right? Uh, she's meant to be my daughter. Of course, she's not your daughter. She's our little Lou. Vanilla, where is my daughter? Oh, well, um, Jasper, it's like this. I, I lost her. Uh, I never brought her to with me. I lost her in Australia 21 years ago. Well, who is this? It's the ball she had round her neck the day we found her. The emerald for that diamond is! That's the earring I placed around your neck the day you were born. It's the earring she had around her neck the day she bounced out of my arms into the arms of the bush ranger who was... Thunderbox, who was riding alongside at the time, who, <laughs> the age of six foot, has reared her to be the beautiful woman she is today. So where's the other earring? I have it here, which just goes to show that you are my daughter after all. And Vanilla, I am very angry with you for this deception. I don't see why. I promised that when you came to collect her, I would have her ready and, and she would be able to go back to Australia with you. I've kept my part of the bargain. You should be grateful, not angry. So, just It was you who took the earring. Yes, it was me. And now I know who I really am. Yes. Yes. My half-sister. <laughs> so any thought of marriage is out of the question. I guess. Hold on a minute there. I think there's something you should know. You see, you are not really Lou's half-brother because you are not my son. Not your son? No, you see, some years ago, Elsie the maid became pregnant and had twins. And because she was unmarried, she was unable to rear them both. Because my wife and I had no children of our own, we undertook to rear one of the little boys as our own. Nobody knows who your father is, but here is Elsie. She is your mother. Son. <laughs> Mummy! Shop. And I'm sad in a way, but at least now I'm free to marry Lou. Oh, but I can't marry you, Gus. Why not? Because you don't know who you really are. <laughs> Elsie is your mother, but until you can find out who your father is, you won't know who you really are. Mummy, <laughs> you can see how important this is to me. Who am I? Who is my father? Well... You know I've always had great trouble keeping my mind on the job. <laughs> on occasions, I've been known to take a, a walk down to the bottom of the garden. So one day, I was down there, well, I ran into thunderbucks. And I must have been able to keep my mind on that job because a little while later, you were born. <laughs> So Thunderbox is my father. And Stringo is your twin brother. <laughs> Now, mine. 
Roll the inox, Bailey. What do you mean? I mean, <laughs> you are not the half brother hiding from me. You are not the half brother of Fenella and Jasper. Their father, Jemima Duke Germain, was not your father at all. My father? What do you have to know this? Because I am your father. <laughs> Stealing something that was rightfully his. You've always been a nasty little brat, Medley. Daddy, I'm so used to being called Lou. What was the name you gave me when I was born? Was it Louise? No, my dear, I'm afraid it wasn't. Oh, what was it? It was John Noel Bryan. <laughs> <laughs> 